Bonjour à toutes et à tous et bienvenue ce matin. On est ravis de vous recevoir ici dans un contexte qui est celui aussi des, des mouvements sociaux. Et on s'est dit que euh, le thème de cette journée se prêtait tout à fait bien à réfléchir ensemble et à accueillir Nico Beignet et Jason Deleon qui nous font l'amitié d'être présents. J'en suis absolument ravi. Et j'espère qu'on réfléchira ensemble au cours de cette matinée, que je vais vous présenter maintenant, brièvement, 10 minutes, pas plus. Euh, Ce n'est pas ma parole qui est importante, c'est la leur. Donc euh, j'en profite aussi pour euh, remercier Lusias, qui nous a permis de, de financer l'invitation de Nico et de, et de Jason. Alors merci beaucoup. Mais les institutions ne sont rien sans les personnes qui les incarnent euh, et repoussent leurs limites, leurs murs. Euh, ou les deux. Et c'est bien ce que nous sommes venus faire aujourd'hui. Parce que l'idée qui nous réunit est celle de réfléchir ensemble aux questions qui se posent ou s'imposent souvent de manière brutale, sinon violente, à celles et ceux dont les vies se heurtent aux frontières, indissociablement physiques et symboliques. Leurs tracés suivent très souvent les intérêts des différents détenteurs du pouvoir de les définir et de les maintenir pour garantir leurs privilèges réels ou supposés. S'il y a des gatekeepers, qui défendent les accès de toutes sortes d'espaces d'appartenance, où les dimensions nationales peuvent se mêler à des considérations d'ordre social, ethnique ou genré, alors il y a par voie de conséquence des politiques de l'altérité. Ce sont autant de manières d'identifier et de désigner celles et ceux que l'on conçoit comme des autres, plus ou moins indésirables, et auxquels on dénie aussi bien la présence, la légitimité, et ce qu'Axel Honnête appelle la reconnaissance. Il s'agit d'une interaction fondamentale qui institue une relation de respect nécessairement mutuelle et dont dépend l'existence, tout comme l'importance sociale, de chaque individu. Car les individus ne sauraient être conçus de manière isolée, mais plutôt en tant qu'élément de l'incarnation et de la participation à une société. Qu'en est-il dès lors de ceux qui, pour différentes raisons, incarnent les frontières Qu'en est-il de celles et ceux qui incarnent les marges plutôt que les centres, ou une forme d'altérité considérée comme problématique lorsqu'elle n'est pas pointée du doigt et infamisée. C'est par exemple le cas des migrants, supposément vecteurs de toutes sortes de dangers pour nos sociétés, à en croire nos gatekeepers patentés. Ce n'est pourtant pas à ces derniers, à leur vision d'un monde replié sur ses frontières, que nous allons nous intéresser aujourd'hui. Nous allons plutôt faire droit à une autre définition de la situation, comme on dit en sociologie, celles des personnes qui, placées dans le viseur infamant des politiques de l'altérité, sont confrontées à l'épreuve des frontières. Une épreuve qu'elles doivent affronter et à laquelle il faut résister encore. Résister encore. Ce n'est pas qu'un jeu de mots. Il fonctionne d'ailleurs qu'en français, à partir de la consonance entre « encore », littéralement « in the body », et « encore »,« again and again ». Au travers de cette expression, il s'agit d'interroger ce geste, résister, dans ce qu'il a de plus incarné et de plus originel, au sens où l'étymologie du verbe « résister » renvoie à l'idée de rester debout, résister ou se maintenir face à l'adversité. Or, il m'est précisément apparu que chacun à leur manière, Jason Deleon et Nico Beignet documentent des formes de résistance ou de confrontation aux politiques de l'altérité dans ce qu'elles ont de plus incarné. Tous deux sont anthropologues. C'est dire qu'ils font marcher les concepts, quels qu'ils soient, sur la terre ferme des observations menées au plus près des personnes qui leur apprennent ce dont est fait leur quotidien, avec ses épreuves, ses difficultés et aussi ses violences. Je n'en dirai que quelques mots qui seront autant d'introductions aux travaux qu'ils vont nous présenter. Parmi les nombreuses enquêtes ethnographiques qu'il a menées, Nico Beignet s'est notamment intéressé dans certains de ses premiers travaux à ce qu'il a appelé la production sociale de l'abjection liée à l'homosexualité et aux différentes manières de troubler les genres dans les sociétés du Pacifique. Pour comprendre ces phénomènes, il a utilisé ses doubles compétences de linguiste et d'ethnographe, sans oublier l'attention particulière qu'il porte à la corporéité. Plus récemment, il a d'ailleurs dirigé une équipe d'ethnographes qui s'est intéressée à la marchandisation des corps masculins <coughs> dont la jeunesse et les forces prélevées dans le sud global sont revendus au Nord, dans les réseaux professionnels du sport globalisé, ou gagnés par une idéologie néolibérale dont les rapports de pouvoir passent à l'intérieur des corps. 
ceux des athlètes migrants qui s'efforcent d'échapper à la pauvreté en tentant de monnayer leurs talents sportifs sont ainsi traversés par toutes sortes d'incertitudes liées à un statut trouble qui les laisse quelque part en suspens, entre figures de l'héroïsme, le champion sportif tel qu'il peut être rêvé, et une certaine idée de l'abjection que ne laisse pas d'inspirer ces migrants à ceux qui, dans nos sociétés, les considèrent comme indésirables. Tout l'enjeu des ethnographies multisituées que l'équipe de Nico a menées sur les cinq continents est précisément de décrire la réalité des expériences, tout comme celle des épreuves que traversent ces jeunes hommes qui n'envisagent leur futur qu'en le projetant ailleurs. Les marchés du cricket, du football, du rugby ou de l'athlétisme globalisé deviennent alors autant de réseaux méandreux dans lesquels l'espoir d'inscription passe par une marchandisation de ces corps aussi sportifs que genrés et racisés. Si l'éclat des talents exceptionnels paraît alors transcender toutes les altérités en formant l'idéal du champion, l'ordinaire et ses innombrables difficultés font souvent des migrants du sport autant de prolétaires et de précaires d'un marché des spectacles sportifs qui ne leur laisse finalement qu'un corps fatigué, parfois blessé, et dès lors renvoyé à l'altérité du migrant, redevenu indésirable. Cette idée du migrant indésirable et toutes les frontières, physiques et symboliques, dont elle ne cesse de souligner la réalité, a d'autres effets incarnés sur lesquels Jason De Leon travaille entre le Mexique et les États-Unis. Dans un livre fascinant, The Land of Open Graves, publié en 2015, il présente l'enquête tout à la fois archéologique et ethnographique menée par son équipe dans le désert de Sonora, sur les traces de celles et ceux qui entreprennent illégalement sa traversée dans l'espoir d'atteindre les États-Unis. Tandis que la clandestinité les confine à l'anonymat, Jason et toute l'équipe du Undocumented Migrant Project s'efforcent depuis près de 15 ans de donner des visages aux statistiques migratoires et surtout de restituer leur identité ainsi que leur dignité à celles et ceux qui accomplissent cette traversée au cours de laquelle beaucoup perdent la vie. Car le désert est utilisé par le Mexique et les États-Unis comme un dispositif de dissuasion. Jason en est d'ailleurs venu à le considérer comme un actant des politiques de l'immigration au sens où le désert constitue un collectif hybride où s'entrecroisent conditions climatiques extrêmes, animaux potentiellement hostiles et dispositifs de surveillance qui exercent leur violence sur les corps vivants ou morts. Car même les cadavres sont engloutis ou effacés par cet actant désertique dont l'utilisation politique exerce contre les corps des migrants ce que Jason appelle une nécroviolence. Ce dont il va nous parler aujourd'hui est en lien avec cette première recherche. Jason l'a prolongé dans le contexte du renforcement de la sécurité aux frontières qui, en 2014, a rendu la traversée du désert de Sonora encore plus difficile et plus mortelle. En réponse à ce durcissement sécuritaire, les migrants se sont tournés vers des gangs transnationaux, tels que le MS-13, de plus en plus impliqués dans le trafic d'êtres humains. Si bien qu'en 2015, Jason a entamé un projet photoethnographique de longue haleine visant à comprendre la vie quotidienne des passeurs honduriens qui tirent profit du transport de migrants le long de la frontière mexicaine. Ce sera le sujet de sa conférence, donnée en avant-première du livre qu'il va bientôt publier sous le titre « Soldiers and Kings ». Tous ces terrains sur lesquels travaillent les anthropologues tels que Nico et Jason sont donc moins les leurs que ceux des personnes dont les expériences ne sont pas que des matériaux pour la recherche. Car leurs épreuves sont aussi réelles qu'incarnées. En les décrivant, on peut espérer les arracher à un oubli auquel les condamnent toutes sortes de politiques de l'altérité, dont les brutalités restent souvent aussi méconnues que cachées. Lever le voile sur ces épreuves, en les montrant du point de vue de celles et ceux qui les vivent au quotidien, est un travail on ne peut plus nécessaire. A-t-il pour autant des effets concrets Vous le savez, Émile Durkheim disait que nos recherches ne vaudraient pas une heure de peine si elles ne devaient avoir qu'un intérêt spéculatif. Autrement dit, les sciences sociales seraient vaines si elles ne devaient se résumer qu'à un débat d'idées incapable de produire quelque effet concret sur nos sociétés et sur les différentes formes d'inégalités qui continuent de prospérer. Nico et Jason n'ont sans doute pas de réponse toute faite à ces questions. Mais ils ont le grand mérite de les poser, chacun à leur manière. Alors écoutons-les, et c'est donc sans plus attendre que je passe la parole à Jason, qui va nous emmener dans le désert de Sonora, aux côtés des migrants, et de leurs passeurs. Avec un petit interlude technique.
excuse me if I'm a little slow. I just came from Lisbon where I didn't get any souvenirs other than food poisoning. So um, I've, <laughs> I've been working through that since, uh, since yesterday. So if you see me sweating, uh, uh, it's just uh, me, 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 me trying to work it out. But, um, but I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, and grateful for this for this invitation. So um, thank you. And I'm going to talk today uh, about a, a, a book, pro two book projects um, on human smuggling across Mexico. One that is a, um, a sort of straightforward ethnography, and one that is a photo ethnography. And so this the talk is kind of a, a combination of those two book projects. The ethnography is is done. Um, and so I'm, we're in the production stage with that now, and the, 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 the book on, on the photography aspect is, is sort of just getting started, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a bit of a preview of, of both of those. <coughs> Soldiers and Kings. You want to make a picture of this, Kingston asks. A small flame materializes as he begins to warm uh, a crack rock that's cradled in the contour of a repurposed aluminum beer can. He takes a hit and releases a powdery cloud, and he tilts his head away from me so as to not blow the smoke right into my face. Go ahead and take a picture, Kingston says, in English that's an accented hybrid of the Bronx, of the New York Bronx, and Honduran Garifuna, Afro-Honduran. I got a lot of these pictures already, I say. I have lots of pictures of you smoking crack. This is kind of boring, I tell him. And he just laughs and says, ha, ha, ha. He says, this stuff is crazy, but it really relaxes me. And I say, but you keep complaining that you can't fall asleep at night. Do you think maybe it's all this cocaine? And he smiles and says, maybe, maybe. Kingston is a funny and incredibly complex individual a former child soldier in the Honduran military who migrated to the U.S. as a teenager. Now in his early 30s, he learned English while incarcerated for almost 10 years in the United States for a series of violent felonies. Once he was released, he returned to Mexico and began to do um, a variety of jobs, robbery, assault, drug dealing, and worse. If you ask him, though, he will tell you that he prefers smuggling his fellow Hondurans. It's safer, it pays better, and is less stressful. Smuggling people gives him less nightmares than the other stuff, the crazy stuff. No hay problema. Toma unas fotos, bro. Take some pictures. Firme. After months of this, Kingston is constantly expecting me to take photos. The room that we're in is poorly lit by a bare light bulb and a pulsing television. I'm shooting at 6400 ISO and pushing the film, yes, I, I still shoot film, four stops with an aperture set to 1.2. Click wind, click wind, click wind. Shooting with film means you don't get distracted by looking at the back of a digital camera to check your exposure. You just keep shooting and hope that you loaded the film correctly, and more importantly, you hope that something interesting comes from that moment. We can hear Tupac Shakur's voice rattle the room directly below us. His voice is mixed with the cackling and the shit-talking that accompanies the, the slamming of dominoes onto a table. Kingston soldiers are partying downstairs. Business is slow right now, because at this point, um, uh, Trump had been in office for about a year. Um, uh, and I don't know if you've been following the, the Trump news, but it's been a pretty good day for a lot of us Americans the last, the last 24 hours. Um, but at this point uh, in, in this story, uh, business is slow because Trump has been in office for about a year and, and much of the anti-immigrant rhetoric has been slowing down migration. And so Kingston says to me, pinche Trump, goddamn Trump. Nobody wants to come because they're afraid that they'll get deported right away. Still, even when there are lots of clients to move, there's a lot of drinking and partying and smoking. It's the same scene every night. I take pictures of these young men partying and so do they. Portraits, selfies, Snapchats. I have enough images of these young men doing this to make an entire book of just people either taking selfies or 
smoking marijuana and crack. But there's nothing really sensational about this behavior. No one is out of control. Everyone keeps it together or they get dealt with by Kingston. For these folks living so close to the edge of death, the excessive consumption of drugs and alcohol is a necessary evil. You needed to relax, Kingston assures me. And it's true. He's much calmer and less stressed out when the, once the cocaine appears. It's a poor man's um, sedative after a, day, a hard day at work. I take a picture of Priest as he exhales. He turns and he stares at me. And I've learned over the years to be slightly afraid of those who don't talk and just stare at me. Don't worry about that dude. He don't say shit, but he a good soldier, Kingston tells me. I've known him for a long time. He's from one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in, San, in, in Honduras. He's fucking crazy. By good soldier, Kingston means he can ask Priest to do his bidding with no questions asked. By quote, fucking crazy, he means that Priest is someone who can be relied upon to do the most serious jobs required by the gang. In this instance, it's really killing people for money. There's always at least one priest in every crew. And I like Priest, and he seems to be fascinated by me. He likes posing for the camera, head tilted back, eyes half shut, smoke billowing from his mouth like some kind of demon. He's got menacing down to an art. But the bulk of these portraits that I make of these individuals cast them in shadows. These aren't images that can be, that, that can, they're, they're typically uh, shown without their faces or as unidentifiable silhouettes. And shooting indoors with poor lighting also means that these folks appear more looming and ominous. And I often worry about images of young black men cast in dark shadows, engulfed in plumes of marijuana and crack smoke. These potential racial stereotypes and photoethnographic practice constantly collide head on in these encounters. Still, Kingston and his most hardcore soldiers, they like it. It adds to the, pu the, the public persona that they cultivate in their own social media, such as this image here. And I've had to tell these guys over the years to really edit their so social media because so many of them just say things like occupation, smuggler, occupation, assassin. And um, I've just keep saying that that's probably not, not the smartest thing um, to be doing. Um, but all of this is related to the fact that in this increasingly violent world of smuggling migrants across Mexico, these guides, these guias, coyotes, polleros, they either have to be crazy or you have to have someone working for you um, who will do whatever is necessary to protect them and their precious human cargo. And many of these folks come from, from very, very violent um, uh, childhoods. But in general, gone are the days where someone could leave Central America and hitch a free train, uh, tr uh, train ride on what's known as La Bestia, the beast. This is because transnational gangs like MS-13, they now control large sections of the migrant trail across Mexico. And Mexican drug cartels control key geographic points throughout the country. Migrants have to now pay a quota, a fee, to both of these groups. They have to pay the MS-13 and they have to pay drug cartels to avoid robbery, kidnapping, or something much worse. And so the safest and best guias, polleros, coyotes at the moment, are those who have a gang affiliation. So if you want to guarantee your safety, you need to pay someone like Kingston or Priest to get you across Mexico. Thus, in order to understand human smuggling, I've had to spend the last seven or eight years um, trying to understand the complicated, difficult, and dangerous lives of the gangsters who now control this market. I have also had to balance my fear and repulsion of what I hear and what I see these men do with my sometimes naive sense of obligation and the care that I feel for people who have trusted me um, and who I have come to trust oftentimes at great personal cost. But I should clarify today that I'm not here to humanize smugglers. Instead, I want to start this talk with the radical proposition that these folks are in fact human and don't need to be humanized. I want to show their humanity even in its most difficult and sometimes disturbing forms. This is why I'm in a dark cement windowless room in Mexico City with Kingston and Priest and many others. 
Since 2015, I've been trying to understand their daily lives um, and also been struggling to represent their experiences using a combination of text and images. And so today I want to talk about two issues. One is just how is human smuggling structured in this current moment? And second, what is gained or lost when we bring a camera into this context? And what can we learn by reflecting on one's own photoethnographic practice? Before I can do that, I just want to give everybody a quick little um, backstory history on, uh, on Plan Frontera Sur. Plan Frontera Sur is a Mexican immigration policy that went into play in 2014. Um, it was created by the Mexican government with the support and a lot of political pressure from the United States. And basically, this was a response to thousands of Central American unaccompanied minors showing up at the U.S.-Mexico border and making it onto the front page of the New York Times. Um, soon after this public relations nightmare happens, Obama at the time comes out and says, we've solved the problem, the border has been secured. What he didn't say was that we didn't do anything at the U.S.-Mexico border. We just suddenly put all this pressure on Mexico to, um, to stop Central American migrants from crossing that, that country. And so this led to mass deportations of people from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, um, a spike in, in corruption amongst the, the growing um, immigration enforcement uh, industry. And in many ways, and I think this is similar to what's happening kind of globally, the United, the Mexico starts to take lessons from the United States in terms of creating its own deportation regimes, its own detention regimes, um, and in general, um, duplicating what, what's been happening um, along the U.S.-Mexico border for many years. And so it's, it's in this context that my project began, was looking at this major shift that Mexico was now um, doing in order to, um, to slow down my, um, uh, my, migration. And I would argue that, it, like, in general, Plan Frontera Sur is just an attempt to move the U.S.-Mexico border down to the border with Guatemala and now to make the entire length of Mexico a physical border to, um, uh, to movement. And we're, we're seeing this in, in a million places where um, we can think about the Darien Gap in southern Panama. We can think about um, what's happening in the Mediterranean. We can, uh, we can think about the ways in which we are outsourcing border enforcement um, from the EU to countries like Libya. We can think about what's happening in Poland. Um, all of these uh, countries that are now taking on major roles for slowing down migration before, before migrants can get to, to destination countries. And so that's, when, that, that's the, the, the back story for this project. Um, but before I can get into it, I guess I have to ask myself and, and, and maybe let you ask me as well, is why take pictures? Why, why am I trying to photograph stuff? To tell you that I'm using a, a camera in this context of human smuggling should raise a bunch of ethical questions immediately, because it does for me. How do you do research ethically in a context where violence, murder, and drugs are not just the norm, but are part of the job description? Why try to photograph this chaos? What is gained and potentially lost or put at risk when we make these images? These are questions that I've been struggling with for a long time. But I would argue that my interest in photography really comes out of um, my long-standing interest in just using a whole variety of different methods to, to document and understand the migration experience. And so the Undocumented Migration Project um, now is, you know, has used a combination of archaeology, photoethnography. We've been giving migrants cameras. We've done a significant amount of forensic work, um, as well as a significant amount of, of exhibition work. And I think a, a lot of this stuff is really um, attempts to translate social science data for, for a general audience. Um, and I just wanted to just talk quickly um, as an aside about how this is related to my different attempts to visualize, um, I, I think, the, the migration experience. This is a map of migrant death along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and this shows about 3,400 um, deceased individuals. Um, since 2019, 
I've been involved in a participatory um, exhibition called Hostile Terrain that has attempted to, to take that map data of migrant death and, um, and visually uh, uh, translate it. I got the idea to print out um, cadaver toe tags, um, orange tags that represent unidentified migrant bodies, manila tags that represent named individuals. And I wanted to create a giant map of, uh, of, of the US-Mexico border. I started asking my students to do this in my lab. And so they were sitting there, they were writing out the names of the dead, and we were getting ready to build this map. And immediately, all of my students started commenting on the fact that writing out names of the dead was a very um, impactful kind of experience. And so I thought to myself, well, what if instead of us making a map of migrant death, we were to ask participants, volunteers from, from other places to do this? Um, and so th th this is sort of where, the, where this idea came from. And it developed into um, this exhibition called Hostile Terrain 94, which is a, um, an interactive exhibition. I'm going to show you here. This is what it looks like in, when, it's, when it's installed. And so what you have here, this is from, the universe, this is from Mississippi State in, in the southern US. People are filling out these tags. They're making a grid map on the wall of the US, of the Arizona-Mexico border. And then they're putting those tags in the exact location of where those individuals were found. Um, and you know, so it's basically a, a, a giant interactive map of, of, of migrant death. And I, I think in, in, in a lot of ways, it's just an attempt to take this visual, um, this two-dimensional graphic, and turn it into something, um, something three-dimensional. Um, and so this has been part of you know, an ongoing um, uh, project that, um, that's, I think, just part of my, my, my interest in the visuality of, of migration in general. And we've done this in, in a variety of locations. I think we're, we've done it at about 90, 90 95 locations um, around the globe. And we're hoping to, to, to reach 150 by next year. Um, we've done numerous European shows in, in Germany, in the Netherlands. And um, I think we, we do have one um, in the works for, for Paris. Uh, but I, I, as an aside, I basically just I, I bring all that up because I think that I have a, a long-standing interest in trying to visualize um, the migration experience in, in different ways. Okay. And, and I think part of it is, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about photoethnography today, it's really, I do believe that combining photography and text can be, um, as Philippe Bourgois and, and Jeff Schoenberg write, um, can be something that's, that's that's more than the sum of its parts analytically, politically, and aesthetically. Um, I do think that, that putting photos in, in conversation with texts can, um, um, can be incredibly productive. And I also think that when you take photography seriously, that we can start to push the boundaries of what ethnography can look like, or I think maybe more for me, what it can feel like. And so this camera has become uh, an important um, <coughs> tool for me not just to produce data, but is also a form of ethnographic practice that's shaped by my position and understanding of the world, um, both my own and the worlds that I seek to understand from the outside. And when I show these photos, and when I take these images, it's not just to simply il illustrate texts that I'm going to write later on. I take pictures to document moments of light, time, and action. I take pictures to remember things I didn't, I didn't see with, with the, or, or to catch things that I didn't see with the naked eye. I photograph to provide partial glimpses of difficult to access worlds. I take these pictures because I think there are some things that cannot be captured with words alone. And so this photoethnography that I'm going to show you today, it's not just me taking pictures of, of smugglers and, and the smuggling world to illustrate words I will later write. I want to add new layers of understanding through these visuals that can complement, contradict, and complicate the ethnographic authority that I claim to own by writing down and theorizing about things that I've heard and, and seen in the field. Margaret Mead once wrote that ethnographic fieldwork, that you start it in a very naive way and that your observations become better, they become more relevant over time. But, she said, photography 
is the opposite. It's a constant and steady record of human behavior that's neither naive in the it's neither naive or or um, sort of educated. It's it just is. And so for her, the photography occupied this kind of objective, sort of scientific um, place, um, and that it could help correct errors that humans were making through through observations, especially when our understanding of someone else's culture was still developing. But I'm going to argue the opposite today. I don't think photography is, um, is mature at all. Um, and I think that it's definitely not static. For me, photoethnography, it's evolving alongside my own understanding of, of human smuggling. Um, my pictures change over time as my understanding changes. And so I don't claim to give you any photographic truth today. Uh, I want to give you my, 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 my changing vision. And I often find um, kinship with um, documentary photographer Eugene Richards when he's writing about, about his image making practices. Um, he's asked about the, the types of camera lenses that he uses. And he says something to the effect of that he likes the wide angle lens because when he uses it, it distorts the image a little bit. And it reminds you. That, that there was a camera present, that what you're looking at, this is not reality. This is a filmic experience. Um, that it's not real life. It's this mediated experience. It's this mediated representation. And, and, I, would, and I would agree. Um, and I think so much of what I'm interested in doing um, is, is this combination of experimentation, but also openness and reflexivity that I, hope, that I hope is honest and sensitive, but also doesn't get into the way of me doing anthropology. Um, and I also think about the corporeality of photography. And I, I take inspiration here from David, David McDougall's work when he writes about photography and he says, quote, meaning is produced by our whole bodies, not just, not just our conscious thought. We see with our bodies, and any image we make carries the imprint of that body. And so photographic images are inherently reflexive, I mean, in that they constantly refer back to the photographer in that moment of creation. Right? And so it's in this encounter with someone else that you see the photographer, that you, you, you see it through the translation of the, this mechanical machine, this camera itself, and then this relationship that you have with the person on the other end of it. And so my photoethnography has no social science confidence that Margaret Mead would want it to. Instead, this is just a, a lot of it's about anxiety. Um, and, uh, but I find it really intellectually and ethically helpful to talk about the details with it um, today. And so in some ways, I'm going to use this room as um, anthropological group therapy to talk about um, my, own, my own practice. And so today, I'm going to kind of walk through um, these five elements that um, American curator John Sarkovsky proposed many years ago about, uh, uh, about image making, the subject, the detail, time, frame, and the vantage point. And I hope that by discussing these things individually that we can begin to, we can begin to, um, to highlight the complicated relationship that exists between visual documentation and representation, the technical and compositional decisions that impact image making, um, but also, I want to argue for a more ethically aware and reflexive photoethnography. So let's look at some images. The thing itself. Tarkovsky argues that, quote, photography deals with the actual, which I think is not all that helpful when you're trying to photograph something as murky and shapeless as human smuggling. This is a complicated, multi-layered 
social process. Um, and so figuring out how to photograph it is challenging. And part of this is because there's no one kind of smuggler and no person is only defined by that occupation. These smuggling communities, they are diverse and they are dynamic. There's a lot of people involved. There's the, uh, the, the, the veterans, the veteranos, the OGs, the, the sicarios, the assassins, the wannabes, the hangers-on, the junior soldiers, the people who Kingston likes to boss around like children, gophers that he sends on drug and grocery runs, runs to make fun of. There's also others who have relatively straight jobs, people who can help you fix your visa papers or pick up money from the bank because they have a clean ID. Those who physically guide migrants across Mexico tend to be men, but there are plenty of women in this community who have their own, their own hustles, some legal and some not. There's also lots of children running around in this environment. Everyone is constantly moving and trying to make ends meet. Gang banging, smuggling, and these migrant communities in Mexico are all superimposed onto each other. Now clearly, anthropology has a tortured history of photographing its research subjects. It's us no surprise that we are often afraid to publish portraits of people that we work with, despite the fact that all of us bring cameras into the field. When we do publish photos, pictures of people are often totally absent, composed in a way that they appear as abstract figures or headless, or their faces are blurred out. Or I like to think about some of my earlier work where it looks like people are wearing um, virtual reality goggles um, as a supposed way to, to protect people's identity. And I think it's rare that we, that we allow the people that we write about the opportunity to look back. And I think part of it is because we don't know what to do with a portrait. It makes us uncomfortable when the other gazes back. Elizabeth Edwards has summarized this feeling with, uh, in respect to 20th century um, preference for anthropologists to take pictures of people as if we're looking at them through aquarium glass. She says, quote, looking into the camera in self-conscious representation marks the presence of the subject, the author, and the viewer. And this challenges the authority of the anthropologist, right? We're supposed to be taking pictures of people acting natural, but I don't think there's anything natural about, eth about ethnographic field work. This is an illusion that we, like to, that we like to perpetuate. In the 21st century, we often rarely defer to the people we work with about, um, about their, um, how to use their, their, their likeness. We often, ref we often defer to our universities who tell us what we can and cannot um, publish. We typically don't um, allow our interlocutors to have any say in these things. We act as if the people that we photograph who live major portions of their lives on the internet, just like the rest of us, that they don't understand the global circulation of images, including their own. And after I, I took this picture of Lester and he said to me, oh, you're going to show this picture to a bunch of uh, Americans, is that right? And I said, yeah, probably. And he says, okay, I want you to tell them that we migrants, we have our drinking well controlled. Um, so I think that people are always much more entertaining um, when, when asked to write their own captions. Um, but I think in, in general, there's this idea that we, this very paternalistic idea that we, are, uh, um, that we know what's best for people. And I think it's very rare that we take them seriously when they want to be seen. And I would say the bulk of the people that I have worked with on this project have said to me that they want to be seen. And part of this is because many of them will not make it to see um, the age of 40. Now, if you go down to, the, to, to Mexico, to the train tracks where migrants are moving, you will see that there are no shortage of young people trying to make it across Mexico. Um, some of them will get to the United States. Many of them will get stuck in Mexico and fall into working uh, on the train tracks as guides. Um, there are uh, an enormous amount of vulnerable youth who have turned to gangs and to smuggling because of the easy money. Um, and so let's, let's, let's meet some of these folks. Chino. So Kingston is a, a veteran, a king, um, a rey, as, as Hondurans will often refer to each other as a term of endearment. 
And Chino is a soldier, a foot soldier, a soldado, a young man who left Honduras when he was 17, the wildest of many uh, children being raised by a single mother in a dirt floor house with no running water. He figured it was better for everyone if he, if he was out of the picture, one less hungry belly to worry about. He spent much of his teenage years on the streets of San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and then later in Mexico riding the train. He's just turned 20, and he and I are sitting in the jungle in southern Chiapas when he starts talking in a town called Pacalna, when he starts talking about this journey that he's been on for years, it seems. He says, quote, I've been riding the train a lot, coming and going, coming and going. If they catch you, they will send you back, and then you try again. And I said, well, how many times have you tried to cross the U.S.-Mexico border? He says, oh, like five times. But once I got across and I was hiding in a tree in Laredo, Texas, it was incredible. I was in this tree. I had my bottle of water. I had my backpack up there. I was hiding from the Border Patrol. I was up there for eight days, he says. But finally, immigration came, and they found me, and they deported me back to, back to Honduras. But then he says, even if you get across the U.S.-Mexico border, then what? Where are you going to go? On the streets, that's where. After failing to join America's undocumented labor force, Chino fell into working on the train tracks as a smuggler for MS-13. He had developed these skills through various gang activities in Honduras after he had become disillusioned with what he was doing in Hon um, um, on the streets of San Pedro Sula. He explains to me why he left Honduras. I could go back if I wanted to, but I'd have to kill people. I could go back and I could have women and cash and drugs, but I would have to kill people whenever they told me to. And I don't want to live like that anymore. And this is a typical story for young soldiers. These kids who attempt to migrate but find it easier to work with gangs and, and, and fall into the world of smuggling. How do you take pictures of these individuals? It's a question that I've long asked myself. These folks are posing for the camera. This is how they want to present themselves to an imagined audience, to you. They hope that you will look at them. And maybe by seeing their faces, the faces of people like Chino, and experiencing their direct gaze, you'll be forced into what Ariella Azule calls a social contract. That, we will, that the people that, we, that look back at us, we can somehow form a relationship that can open up new forms of visibility. But before I can do that, before I can sell you on this, you have to understand who Chino is. I have to sell you on Chino the person, Chino the worthy ethnographic subject. His gaze needs to be contextualized. And I struggle with how to photograph him. Unlike Kingston, who has been in the game for so long that he can probably never get out, Chino still has the chance to leave. But how do I photograph him? In the shadows and out, of, and out of focus, like I do with Kingston? Do I use the camera to show him behaving wildly, as he often does? How do I visually represent Chino, the soldier, the drug addict, the young man who boasts of killing people? The kid who intimates that his favorite part of smuggling is when he trades uh, protection for sexual favors? Or do I tell you all of these things and then show you someone who is smiling and optimistic, this vulnerable youth caught between violence and poverty at home and violence and poverty on the migrant trail. The detail. Tarkovsky writes that the photographer is tied to the fact of things and that, that they have to go out into the, into this, the world um, and take these fragments and these clues 
and assemble them into some kind of a coherent narrative. You've got to isolate certain things and make an argument for why they are important. And I think that's exactly what we do with ethnography. We go out into the world, we observe it, and then we decide what is important and what is not. We edit, we extract, we make an argument for particular, um, particular moments and meanings. We choose the details and then argue for its significance. But I, but, I, but I want to think about ethnography and photoethnography also as not just the selective editing, but also this endeavor that's retrospective, right? It freezes a moment, but it's also collaborative. Maybe what Tim Engle would call a work in progress. People make themselves visible, and then the person behind the camera, me, I have to make these technical and aesthetic decisions about that moment. So we're both, this is both retrospective and this active collaboration. Mid and low level Central American smugglers in Mexico, they have relatively short lifespans, which makes my friend Flaco, who's in his 30s now, he's like Kingston, he's a veteran, a survivor. It also helps that he's charismatic and funny. Every time I visit my friend Flaco, he laughs and says he's gonna tie me up and take all my shit when I try to leave. I'm pretty sure he's joking most of the time. And over the years, he has taught me a lot. I now know how to make homemade body armor in preparation for a prison riot. I've increased my lexicon of Spanish words for sex organs and drugs. I've also learned what questions not to ask. When I'm in the field, I often shoot with a, a battered black Nikon F2 camera. It's covered in electrical tape to make it less conspicuous and to lower its estimated resale value. When I'm in Chiapas, I often shoot with, um, with a co color film called Kodak's Ultramax 400. It's the cheapest 35 millimeter color film that Kodak currently makes, although film is no longer cheap in this current moment. Um, I used to spend $3.50 on this film in 2015 when I began it, and now I'm spending $24 a roll. Um, it's just prices have become so inflated. Um, but I became interested in, in, in this particular color film because other films that I was experimenting with um, were not doing um, a good job of capturing um, uh, uh, darker skin tones. Um, in particular, um, Kodak Portra, which is a, which is a very famous um, uh, 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 film version. Um, I like Ultramax because it has a particular kind of distortion that I prefer um, to the higher grain and clarity you get with, with more high-end color films. For me, Kodak Ultramax does a good job of capturing the overpowering color and the brutal sunlight of southern Chiapas. I think the saturation and the grain could convey a certain eth ethnographic tone. Um, and as I've experimented with other, with other films like Kodak Portra 160 um, and discovered that in many ways, and it's, you can, it's kinda hard to see on these slides, um, Films like Portra do a very poor job of, of showing detail for darker colored skin. And cultural critic Lorna Roth has written about the fact that this is because these Kodak films were, are calibrated for light skin. Um, and there's a long history of racism within, within photography that does not take into consideration people of darker complexion. Um, and so for, you know, part of this journey for me has been trying to figure out the, the most appropriate um, film types to capture, to capture darker, um, darker skin tones. Um, and I will say that when I take pictures of my friend Flacco, um, he's mostly outdoors and he's mostly shirtless, which means he is permanently tanned a golden brown. And his body shows the colorful wear and tear and the handmade markings of someone who has made a living on the train tracks for years in places where a physic a, an intimidating physical presence is an occupational asset. I shoot black and white photos of Flacco occasionally in those rare moments that we are indoors, but it never feels completely right. When I render him in monochrome, it's as if I'm missing something about his character, his lifestyle, and his working environment. I make pic pictures of Kingston and other Garifuna Afro-Honduran smugglers in black and white because we spend so much time indoors. Um, and this is largely because of the racism that, Hondur that Afro-Hondurans experience in Mexico um, and the fact that um, a lot of these guys are being hunted by other gang members. And so there is a real fear for their, for their lives.
And in general, Flacco doesn't do good, doesn't, do, doesn't like being indoors, he doesn't do well in black and white. Um, oops, sorry, let me go back. I could tell you lots of stories about Flacco and his crew of fair-skinned mestizo Hondurans and Mexicans that involve sex and violence, swindling customers, snorting cocaine, freebasing methamphetamines, and chain-smoking weed. These are the details that you expect to hear about smugglers, about coyotes, and they are interesting and important, but they don't completely define those who undertake this dangerous occupation. Flacco likes to talk about his family. I love my kids, bro, he constantly tells me as he kisses an invisible rosary around his neck and points to the heavens. His numerous cell phones contain digital pictures of his toddler son. He shows off wire transactions of receipts that record the money he has sent home to pay for diapers, medicine, and food. It's money that he's made from smuggling people, but also ripping them off. People that I have trust have told me that my friend Flacco is a bad person. And yet every time I speak to him on the phone, he ends our conversation by saying, God bless you, bro. Time. Time on the migrant trail cannot be accurately measured with a watch or a calendar. I think this is because it has its own sociocultural logic. And it's subject to, to the social forces and complex spatial dimensions of clandestine movement. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast. But even when migrant time is slow, we know it's going to pick up. And maybe you just have a few hours notice before you've got to kiss your mother goodbye and, and hop onto a train. Maybe you spend two days looking at the lush Guatemalan countryside through a cracked bus window while you quietly repeat a phone number over and over again. It's a, the number of a relative. Having this number burned into your brain will be helpful because later you'll be robbed at the Rio Suchiate by Mexican immigration agents. Later you might find yourself repeating that number over and over again because you're tied to a wobbly chair in a muddy colonia on the outskirts of a godforsaken place called Quetzalcoatlcos. This is because Flacco has sold you out to kidnappers. From where you're seated, all you can see are the feet of mangy dogs passing outside a crookedly hung door. Is it morning? Is it night? Pain distorts your sense of time. But just keep saying that phone number out loud so that they will call someone. Anything to make them put the lit cigarettes and the knife away. Sometimes migration time is slow. Other times it's brutally fast. It contracts and expands. It stands still and it speeds up. It's as long and slow as the days waiting for new customers or victims on the train tracks. If you're Chino, maybe you kill time getting a homemade tattoo. And you hope that sharing a needle with six other people won't kill you later. You pass the days monitoring the healing process on your catracho tattoo, which is slang for Hondurans. Smugglers and migrants have had to recalibrate their internal clocks to deal with these wide temporal fluctuations. And so have anthropologists. How do you capture migrant time? Are you looking for that decisive moment that, Sar that, uh, that Cartier-Bussan talks about? Sarkovsky writes that, quote, there is no such thing as an instantaneous photograph. All photographs are time exposures of shorter and longer duration. Time is always present. How do you photograph migrant time? The frame. A greasy four-year-old with a poorly sewed hair lip wearing nothing but tattered khakis. He points to the camera that's around my neck and mimics as if he's inhaling glue out of a plastic bag. He wants me to take his picture. He's a child Robinson Crusoe shipwrecked on the train tracks. A skinny Garifuna teenager lying in bed with two broken ankles and a bloody bandage covering one eye. A federal agent pushed him off of a train. It takes two of us to pick him up and put him into a wheelchair so he can join his friends for a somber lunch in the migrant shelter. 
These are images forever remembered, but with no photographic evidence. Mostly because I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to take a camera out and make a picture of these things. I couldn't frame any of these painful or poignant moments. But I would argue that the things that we don't photograph are often just as important as what we do. Unfortunately, we rarely get the opportunity to write about the times where the camera was purposely tucked away or the user was too paralyzed to use it. Let's compare two photographs. This one with this one. These two images were made 30 seconds apart with a, degree, a, a difference in degree of about 45 angles. I took the one on top because I wanted to convey the sense of boredom that often accompanies smuggling. I took the, the second photo on the bottom uh, because I wanted to convey the sense, of, uh, the sense of boredom that often accompanies ethnographic fieldwork. That is my longtime collaborator, Michael Wells, who's asleep there in the middle. On this particular day, we had spent seven hours on the train tracks with a bunch of smugglers eating, drinking, napping, and finding various ways to entertain ourselves. So much time spent waiting for something interesting to happen, for something interesting to photograph. Looking at these two images, I think, highlights two obvious facts. First, what makes it into the viewfinder and what we leave out is, de is a deliberate decision that changes everything. As I'm making these images, this is, this is editing in real time. And what comes before and after the shot can provide insight into that process. And secondly, I think the first picture illustrates the supposed nobility that comes with the low angle portrait. And the second picture on the bottom, the, the brutally demystifying effect of the wider frame. When I took this picture of my collaborator, Michael Wells, and I don't necessarily think he likes me showing people pictures of him sleeping, um, I never thought I would do anything with it. I just thought it was a funny image. But I think that now, so many years later, if I ever do write a fieldwork manual, this will be the image on the cover. OK, last, last part, vantage point. I took a class once with a renowned street photographer, a guy named John Free in Los Angeles. And we were out walking around one day. And he said to me, he says, I find it so interesting that when people see something that they want to take a picture of, they pull out their cell phone and immediately take that picture from where they're standing. He says, it's like they decided that from that particular place, that was the, the, the best location from which to make that image. They didn't get closer. They didn't go farther away. They didn't go high. They didn't go low. They just sort of stopped there and, and, and did it from that, from that moment. And I think you could say something similar about the anthropological gaze that we often cast upon undocumented migration. I had submitted a book chapter once to an edited volume on migration. And the editor wrote back to me, and this was a, an edited volume that had 15 chapters all on migration. My chapter was the only chapter that had images taken by migrants themselves. The editor wrote back and said, we will not be able to publish these photos because they are, quote, too blurry. And so I wrote back and I said, I was angered for a lot of reasons. Number one, just because I think that to have a, the, the one image taken by migrants that you're not going to include because it doesn't fit your aesthetic desires. Um, but I also, you know, wrote back and I said, you know, I don't think migrants are worrying about things being in focus when they're trying not to die in the desert, right, um, or, or be arrested. And I think part of this issue of not wanting to publish these images is that we don't necessarily like the migrant or smuggler vantage point because it calls into question anthropological authority. Maybe the photos that migrants take remind us of the arrogance of the supposed clarity of participant observation. But I've said it before, and I'll say it again. We can never fully participate, nor should we, no matter how hard we try. Maybe we don't like the smuggler's vantage point because it's messy, ambiguous, and complicated. To quote Sarkovsky one more time, to a photographer, the world consists of an infinite number of vantage points, places to stand, of which very few are altogether satisfactory. Our goal right, is to capture a moment of the world in a way oops, that's lively 
and 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 clear. But I think my own favorite um, anthropological vantage point is the one that highlights how awkward ethnography is. So I love it when I give people cameras and they take my picture, and it just highlights just how awkward and sometimes uh, bizarre this this whole this whole this whole process is. And I think in general, using a camera for me and ethnography in general is this practice that's a steady mix of anxiety, right? a, a gaze into the mirror wondering, am I doing the right thing? Am I asking the right questions? Should I be taking this photo? Who is gazing at whom? What kind of spectacle am I doing right now as I make this image? For me, an anthropologist who takes pictures of people caught up in this brutal process of smuggling, there's no one token moment of reflection. There's no one token moment where I'm, I'm, I'm self-aware and then, and then suddenly not. The entire process is me worrying. It's me thinking about ethnographic tone, the ethics of representation, the type of film that I'm using, the, the shutter speed, all of those things. Constructing the frame is not separate from the messiness of culture. Instead, I think undocumented migration should be un understood as one long take in which the, the technical, methodological, theoretical, and ethical collide. And they continue to collide long after that photo is taken. Epilogue. Shortly after I got back from the field one summer, Chino sent me this picture via WhatsApp. It showed him laid out on a hospital bed, the series of stab wounds and a tube draining fluids from his chest. He said, look what the panadero did to me, the bread man. The bread man was another smuggler I'd been working with. Chino had been brutally stabbed by him on the train tracks after he had decided to leave the smuggling game and try to go back to Honduras. This photo that he sent me confirmed what he told me the last time I saw him, that his life was in danger. This was a visual cry for help. For someone who, from someone whose picture I had taken many times. I responded with a thousand questions. How could I be of assistance? What did the doctor say? Are you going to be OK? Can I call you back on this phone and we can figure this out? He says, don't call me back because I stole this phone from the security guard. And if he hears it ring, he'll know that I have it. Um, so we, 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 we try to figure out what, what his game plan is. But before we could figure out his medical options, he was bandaged up given a, a bottle of aspirin and, and put on a bus back to Honduras. And I remember it so vividly. It was a bright morning just a few days after I received this photo. The sun was shining on my bare feet as I looked out the window of my house in Michigan where I was living at the time. I was kind of staring off into the distance, but I was also mentally visualizing this photo that I had, that I had taken of Chino that, that summer. This picture I'd made of him with his gaze locked on me. I remember saying to him at the time, maybe this will be a photo I'll put in the book that I'll write about you. It's the mental image that I, that I have to hang on to as I keep hitting play on a voicemail message from his girlfriend that I just keep playing over and over again. And the message is simple and short. Chino is dead. I have to visualize that this day on top of a train because the accompanying photo to that heartbreaking message is too brutal to look like, to look at. It's a photo that I don't think I myself would have been able to take, but it's a photo that I find now many years later that I haven't been able to run away from. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for this fascinating talk. It's hard to say anything after that, so I will um, I will give the the place to the question uh, you will be asked about your research. You can ask your question in French or in English as you want, and if it's in French, we will translate. Donc, question en français en anglais, comme vous voulez. 
Et si c'est en français, on, on, on traduira. Um, I will start it in English. Thank you very much for your presentation, and then I will reformulate it. I mean, I will say it in French, okay? So I have two remarks. Um, you used um, quite a lot your own photographs for the res research, but at one point <coughs> you mentioned that um, the persons about uh, who you made your research, they were taking photos themselves on social networks. I happened to read an article by one of your colleagues who is Stuart Forrest and who is now at Stanford and who did research on gangs. And um, he made a very thorough analysis. Um, he named that code of the tweet um, about how gangs portray themselves on social media. And I was wondering whether um, the people that you have um, talked with and about who you wrote and about who you spoke now um, had s similar strategies in defending their identity or the type of activities in which they were involved. So this is the first point. And the second, you spoke about one of your projects that you named Hostile Terrain. Um, and it made me think to Human Terrain <laughs> System, which was a horror for the American anthropologies. Um, I don't know in Europe how many people heard about that, but um, I mean, you, you know that this was a project of the um, American army um, that involved sending anthropologies to Afghanistan and Iraq and use people. And I was wondering whether your own project was something like a response to, to deny that. Thank you. Donc, je vais euh, formuler les, les remarques en français. La, euh, la première euh, concernait euh, le fait que, en fait, je voulais savoir si euh, les personnes enquêtées ont utilisé euh, eux-mêmes des images sur les réseaux sociaux, euh, puisque j'ai été inspirée beaucoup par, euh, en fait, le, euh, le travail d'un sociologue ethnographe américain qui s'appelle Stuart Forrest, qui est professeur à Stanford et qui a justement euh, élaboré euh, une catégorie qu'il appelle « Code of the Tweet » et à travers laquelle, en fait, ces groupes, euh, les groupes que lui, il a observés qui sont des gangs, euh, essayent de défendre leur identité. Donc, je me suis posé la question si, effectivement, euh, donc dans, dans le, le, ce type de, de terrain, on a peut-être observé euh, ce genre de mécanisme. Et la deuxième euh, remarque concernait euh, le euh, programme dont Jason a parlé, justement, « Hostile Terrain », et je, je, lui ai, je lui ai demandé si effectivement il a envisagé ça comme une réponse à une horreur qui s'est passée euh, aux États-Unis. Euh, donc c'est un programme qui a été lancé par l'armée la, américaine et qui s'appelle euh, Human Terrain System. Euh, et ce, dans ce programme, on a euh, utilisé des anthropologues dans les guerres d'Irak et Afghanistan euh, justement pour euh, mieux pouvoir combattre l'ennemi. Et donc ça a créé... Euh, une réaction énorme dans la communauté des anthropologues américains, effectivement, parce que ce n'est pas possible d'utiliser les gens, enfin, ou en tout cas les connaissances pour ce genre de choses. Et je voulais voir si Jason, effectivement, il a conçu son programme comme une, enfin, pour contredire ce que, ce que l'armée américaine a fait. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you for both of those, those questions. Um, the social media question I think in, in some ways, yeah, I mean, all of the, the people that I work with are relatively active on, on social media. And I think in, in general, um, you know, social media is sort of a, a metaphor for how the lives of smugglers kinds of work. I mean, right, we, we only, we, t we tend to only post on social media when we're, when we're having the best time. Right, like we, we, we present this version of ourselves, like I'm on vacation, you know. Um, we don't present like, oh, I have no money, I'm broke, I'm not, you know. We, we, we tend to hide the worst parts of our, of our lives on social media and just, we, there's this false sense of, you know, this is what, you know, I, I live this wonderful kind of existence. And with, with smugglers, um, they both are, con you know, they present themselves on social media you know, with guns, with big stacks of money, with, all, you know, you know, partying. But one of the things that I've tried to do with this project is to show that, um, 
you know, smugglers, at least the, the, the level of the, the low level smugglers that I work with live incredibly precarious lives. And, um, you know, they are always on the verge of collapse. They are, I mean, it, it's, um, they actually end up making very little money and it's kind of boom and bust. Um, but, uh, you know, they have this persona that they need to, to, to present. Um, and I think that that persona is both on social media, but also, you know, when I'm with them in, in real life where, you know, they, they're talking about how much money they have, about how great things are going. And then behind the scenes, when we sit down and talk, they talk about how, you know, how terrible things are. Things are, you know, how they're struggling. And, um, and so a, a big part of my project has been to show that to be successful at smuggling means conveying the sense of control and power and this hyper masculinity and wealth. And yet none of those folks, you know, they're all barely, barely hanging on. Um, but you definitely see it in their um, in their social media um, per persona. And in terms of the um, the exhibition Hostile Terrain, um, the language of Hostile Terrain is taken directly from U.S. Border Patrol language from a, a, a policy called prevention through deterrence that attempts to use um, the natural environment as a way to slow down migration. It, it's killed, it's killed thousands of people. Um, it began in 1994, which is why it's Hostile Terrain 94, um, as a reference to that year. Uh, but the language itself comes from, you know, a Border Patrol statement that says something to the effect of, if we force migrants over, quote, more hostile terrain, it'll be easier for us, it'll be more difficult for them and easier for us to, um, um, you know, to police them, to catch them, or, 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 or whatever. Uh, but, I, you know, I think in general, there are lots of, um, I'm always interested in taking that language and using it back, um, you know, especially like um, <coughs> this, this sort of hyper-militarized language, I think, trying to claim it, make it into something else, and then, and then highlight the fact, you know, show it for, for, for what it is. Um, and so, yeah, in, in some ways, it was a very purposeful deployment of, you know, of, of that phrasing. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I have a question. I, well, I am myself uh, use photography and visual during ethnography, and so I found many of your points very, very interesting. My, my question concerns more of um, the selection you made. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe you mentioned it in the introduction. Uh, I wasn't there. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, uh, the fact that uh, your mm, people you represent are mainly boys and young men. So uh, at the same time, you mentioned that uh, smuggling and migrants are uh, heterogeneous communities and there are many women integrating them. So I wanted to know if uh, this choice is um, in some way in an, an involuntary choice due to the fact that you are a man, an adult man, uh, holding a camera and how it, uh, uh, talking about reflex reflexivity, how this affected your field work in this selection uh, filtered by gender. And also uh, I wanted to know something about um, girlfriends, mothers, and uh, occasional partners that are probably the female figures around this uh, scene. Um, and another question is uh, related to the, the risks. Uh, it can sound as a mm, banal question, but um, uh, taking pictures of uh, gang members in the context of uh, border control, migration in Central America is very dangerous. And I wanted to mention the work of uh, the photographer Christian Poveda that you probably know, which, uh, who worked for many years on uh, Las Maras Salvatrucha in uh, El Salvador, and uh, uh, who got killed after uh, finishing one of his mm, best documentaries. So mm, maybe if you want to share something about this. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um. So in this, in the current book project, there, this is an incredibly gendered space, and um, and I have you know mostly access to men because of because of my own my own position. Um, in the in the in the book project, there are two women who play key roles, and and, and I don't show any images of them t today. Um, 
and I don't actually, you know, even have a lot of photos of them, you know, despite the fact that I worked with them for, for many, many years, my, for me, like my relationship to them with the camera was very, very different from the relationship I had with, with men with the camera. The men um, always were posing, always wanted me to get the camera out. And with the women, it was, um, I think we were all equally uncomfortable with me taking pictures of them because it just, it, and you know, they would say these things like, you know, or, 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 you know, I don't want my picture taken kind of thing. Um, not that I didn't, I wasn't close to them. It was just that for whatever reason, we had all decided that, um, that it just, that wasn't going to be our kind of relationship. And so I have, you know, some photos of them that'll, that'll be in this book, but nowhere near the level that I have with, with these other men. Um, but it was a, you know, that was a very, um, I consciously went into this project trying to understand the role that women were playing in this whole thing. And one of the things that, a couple things sort of happened. Um, all of the men that I was with always got worried when I started to talk to women. They were like, they, they just did not want, that. and then the women would say to me, that's because these guys are full of shit. And they know that if you talk to us, that you're going to learn the, the real truth about this stuff. Um, and so I worked hard to, to, to talk to women in these contexts. But the men who I often had to defer to because of the dangers of this work, like if they said you can't talk to them, you know, then I was, I was sort of limited. Um, but uh, yeah, it ended up creating this kind of weird dynamic for me with, with the camera where I, I was totally at ease photographing men and every time the camera came out with the women I worked with we all got kind of awkward about it um, and so I just didn't try to push you know push the um, push that fact very much um, despite the fact that you know I was interviewing them actually mo a lot, oftentimes for longer periods of time than I was with these other folks but the, the camera in that sense just didn't um, it played a different kind of role um, and and I had to get comfortable I think with the with with this process of there are moments where you know I'm like I'm doing anthropology and the camera doesn't work like it just this is not a photographable kind of moment and um, that was hard in the beginning because I wanted to get pictures of everything and I had to get to a point where I just said okay this is not going to be a space where the camera's going to going to going to be happening um, and so yeah that was a that was that was sort of ongoing um, the and I and I didn't photograph a lot of kids either um, I mean, kids get photographed a little bit, but I was always, I didn't photograph kids really, and I didn't photograph migrants um, in this context, or I avoided photographing migrants um, because I just, I didn't want to complicate their lives. They already had strained relationships with these smugglers, and so when we were together, I, I tried to just be with the smugglers, and they didn't want me talking to, to, to migrants either because that undermined sort of their authority or... Um, there was a bunch of complicating kind of kind of factors, um, but in general, you know, in, in terms of the danger stuff, um, I mean, it, it there were moments that it felt dangerous, um, but I I really had to defer to, I mean, I had to tr trust these folks really deeply to make sure that nothing bad was going to happen to me, and um, uh, and thankfully, a lot of the guys I worked with understood the project and understood the importance of photography and so they were um they sort of guided me through this whole process um and and it was weird i mean there were, like I, there's a moment i write about in this book where i meet a bunch of um like um i meet a bunch of guys who were who have just arrived in this safe house who were there to you know to basically do a bunch of contract contracted killing um and my hope my my like host Flacco, he's like, these guys are really dangerous. Don't ask questions about this stuff, you know. And I said, you know, that's fine. I'm not like, I, I wasn't ask, I, I was never asking questions about murder, even though it was happening. People wanted to talk about it. Um, but he got really nervous for me with these guys, and um, and like I don't really know how to re like. When I get nervous, I talk more, and so he was like, he's like, we can't go anywhere now because if you leave suddenly. You have this camera. Maybe people are going to be more sketched out about this whole thing. And so, um, you know, in like my most kind of scary moments, I ended up staying with those guys for like a full day and taking their pictures about you know 400 times um, because they suddenly got interested in like, oh, who is this person? Um, you know, 
what kind of story does he want to tell? And so in some ways, the people who I was most afraid of were often the ones who wanted me to photograph them the most, which was not, I mean, which I didn't like because I wanted to just not be involved in that. But, um, <laughs> but I'm very much happy that this project is totally done. I mean, this is like, I mean, it was a very difficult emotionally, like mentally, um, so, um, I mean, it sent me back to therapy. I mean, it did this, this like, s seven years of this was too much, and um, um, it was a lot of, um, things affected me in ways that I didn't even imagine that was gonna happen. Um, and so, like, you know, nightmares about me holding a camera and being chased by, you know, knife-wielding assailants. Um, so, yeah, I'm, my family's happy this project is done. I'm incredibly happy this project is done. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a very, very challenging. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, thanks for your presentation. It was fascinating and really sorry that I couldn't make it earlier. Um, I would have a question, so sorry if you, if you talked about uh, at the, in the introduction, I would have a question about, uh, you know, collecting uh, pictures of uh, migrants, um, or this collection uh, of uh, yeah, WhatsApp uh, or social network pictures. Um, what, and you have a project, broader project to, to, to collect it more. So what are the implications in terms of uh, our history and history from below? In the sense, um, my own few works in India, and here it's a really a big thing. So I don't know the literacy rate of the migrants uh, you studied, but in India, migrant workers have a very low literacy rate. And for the historians, it's, got, it's becoming like it's starting, and it's going to, I think, explode. It's, it's starting to be a big stake to collect all the WhatsApp videos and all, because uh, these, are, these are tokens of life, of, uh, of uh, souvenirs that were really difficult to analyze before, not for anthropologists, but for historians. Because uh, when I discuss, for example, with my fellow uh, subaltern historians, they would say, you know, but migrant workers, we have you anthropologists on interpretation of your life. But then with, uh, with WhatsApp images, with WhatsApp videos, we have a primary source in the sense that uh, you know, these guys are really fan of, uh, for example, Rancière and the thing, um, his book, Nuit Proletaire, which uh, was based on letters, you know, from uh, workers in France in the 19th century. And so, um, anyway, my question is, uh, in your context, which is different, is it also becoming a huge stake uh, in the sense that uh, we have, for, we would have for the first time, a huge amount of primary resource on this people's life? Yeah, um, you know, that's a great, a great question. I mean, a lot of the guys that I work with are not literate. And so, and same thing with my first book, you know, when I, the people that I was writing about in that, in my first book, they were never going to read it, but they definitely wanted to see themselves in that, you know, the, 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 the image is, is the most accessible thing for them. Um, and, you know, I think in a lot of ways, um, it's more inclusive than any other f form of representation because they can easily recognize themselves, they can show themselves to others. Um, and so in some ways that's been really Im important for me. But in terms of the, the social media stuff, you know, we have a new project that we're doing right now, just trying to archive what's on TikTok, what's on Facebook. I mean, there's this huge, huge repository of information, of people telling their own stories. Um, and I, I worry that we're not taking it seriously enough as a form of, as an archive, as a digital archive. And so we've been trying to, to get money um, and grants to, to start this process. I mean, I have a student right now who is doing a, a project on, about TikTok and smugglers, and he just is going through, you know, and collecting videos of smugglers in the desert, crossing borders, migrants sort of telling their stories, and it's pretty amazing, you know, the things that, that, that are there, and I think it's completely, um, you know, you know, it's underappreciated, uh, and the, the fact that, like, I would always much rather have that perspective over my own because, you know, the, like, if I can privilege the voices of others or the visuals of others, that for me is always a, you know, a desire. But I think that we're just now starting to realize that, that there is this kind of amazing archive. We just don't know really what to do with it yet or how to even go about collecting it. Um, so yeah, we're, we're starting to work through the social media outlets to collect this stuff. 
And then we're, we're also hoping to create a, a digital portal where migrants can just upload their own materials um, and you know, give us context for, for what we're saying. Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, um, uh, je pose ma question en anglais. Je vais, je vais expliquer un petit peu en français après. Hein? Um, so I have a very pragmatic, practical question about how you deal with IRB, mm. uh, given the fact that, you know, so it's, it's bad in, in the U.S., it's terrible in Europe, because suddenly Europe has realized that, they, you know, they, traditionally it was absolutely nothing. You could do whatever you wanted, and then suddenly, you know, it's just like the Nazis have uh, arrived. Uh, so how, how do you deal with your, you know, with your, your university? So IRB, ça veut dire uh, Institutional Review Board, et ce sont, ce sont des comités qui uh, doivent donner l'autorisation pour des questions d'éthique et d'ontologie. Donc uh, si, c'est surtout peuplé par des par des, des gens en médecine, euh, en psychologie, etc., qui font de, de la recherche. Euh, D'ailleurs, ça, ça, ça vient en fait de, 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 de pratiques absolument terribles en médecine, où les gens ont, ont, ont été donnés des virus sans, sans, sans le savoir. Il y a des cas extrêmement célèbres. Euh, et donc, euh, pour ce genre de questions, d'abord, ils veulent euh, que... que, 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 que Oh, oh, that, that's very interesting with respect to social media as well. Mm. It, I mean, in Australia, you cannot use social media data without the um, the approval of the people who. Vous avez compris ça? Donc, donc, c'est vraiment une 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 une, uh, une politique qui est qui est vraiment constrainte. Et je me demande comment comment il uh, comment il uh, il manage tout ça en fait. Yeah, I mean that. The IRB, if, I mean, it's, I went through a lot of hoops, you know, and um, the problem, well, when I began this project at the University of Michigan, the IRB there, they couldn't, they weren't sure if I was a journalist or an, what the difference was between a journalist and an anthropologist was. And they argued, I had to go to a meeting with a bunch, with the full IRB board And I, I listened to them argue about whether or not what I was doing was social science research. And my conclusion was, if you want to call me a journalist, go ahead and call me a journalist, because then now I don't have to deal with the IRB, right? Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, they asked, you know, it, um, as long as things were anonymized, and but, there, you know, there was vague language that they, you know, that they were, they had worded it so, so vaguely That, um, that I was like, it just got so, it got very frustrating with like, I don't know what's going to happen. You want me to explain to you exactly what's, what I'm going to ask about? And um, it's, uh, you know, of course, you can never know what the future is going to bring. Um, but, you know, the IRB at the end of the day, after jumping through a bunch of hoops, um, uh, basically they were like, as long as the f you don't, like, you don't show photos of the, You don't, you don't connect photos of people's faces to their stories of the living, then we're okay. So you can photograph people, you can write about people, but, we, but, but they, have to be, they have to both be kind of anonymous. And this, there was no discussion at the time about like facial recognition software. There's all these things that had not caught up that no one was thinking about at the time. Um, but yeah, I kind of just, they somehow pushed it through. Um, And, you know, now, I mean, the only pictures that you see that I publish now of people's faces are people who are, who are either dead or they're people that I don't talk about directly. Um, but it was, the IRB was very, very challenging. And I think for me, at the end of the day, right, like the IRB, they just don't want to get sued. Like, the, you course. know, they don't care about, the, we don't care about the people we work with, or right, you. or me. Um, and so um, I just kind of, you know, I feel like, It's as long as, uh, you know, our own internal checks and balances about the people we work with, I think are always going to be more insightful and nuanced than, than whatever the IRB comes up, yeah. comes up with. But yeah, I mean, it's a... How about open data? Les données ouvertes? In terms of... Well, the, the, the more and more we yeah. have to... <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, with, with this project, um, I was not asked to, to provide any open data. And, and all of the grants that I had to do this work, did not require that. Um, that, that 
with the stuff we're doing now with like missing migrants, um, you know, we've had to, we've, we're, we're working through to figure out, yeah, what, is it worth the, the funding to make certain things public or is it not? Um, and that's kind of, we've been kind of doing that. I'm, I'm working on an isotope project around missing migrants and then I, and then, um, I run a nonprofit that works with families of missing migrants. We, we maintain a database of about you know, 7,000 open missing persons reports that we've been able to not get certain funding because they want that to be open access. And it's like, well, you know, this is highly sensitive data. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a real challenge right now, especially with the, away with a lot of the funding. Um, you know, agencies really want this open data, you know, with, with the idea that, um, you know, the assumption is that open data is good for everybody, but I don't think it's necessarily the case. Right? I'm, I'm really sorry, but I have to watch the clock, you know. <laughs> and uh, perhaps we will take one last question if someone wants to ask one. Okay. Uh, J'ai une question en français. Uh, je voulais savoir comment ça s'est passé pour uh, prendre contact avec les personnes, avec Kingston et du coup les passeurs, et uh, comment ça a marché pour les trouver, pour uh, négocier le terrain et tout. Um, you know, I think one of the things about smuggling, I've, I've been asked this um, a lot about, you know, how does one get access to this group of people? Was it, was it hard? Um, I found it to be incredibly easy to get access to these folks. Um, and I think part of it is because I maybe it was the first person in their lives ever who went to them and said, I think your stories are really important and I want to understand them. And that was like, you know, an unexpected thing. I mean, these are folks who, who no one ever listens to them. And they made that clear to me in the beginning that, you know, someone actually said to me, no one ever listens to our story. Why don't you write about us? And that was kind of what kicked this off. Um, and, you know, once I met, you know, it was like a uh, kind of, I met one person, I met Chino, I met some other folks, and then they introduced me to other smugglers. Um, and then by the end, you know, I had a lot of contacts. And, you know, people would describe me as like, I'm their, like the, the chronicler, I'm their historian, you know, the journalist, they had many names for me. Um, but they all kind of wanted, I think for a lot of them, they realized that this will be the only time that anyone will listen to them. And that in some ways they hope that, you know, that their story will be known, that they will live beyond, the story will, will outlive them, you know, if this book ever comes out. Um, but uh, it ended up being very, very easy. And in, in a lot of ways, I think I had, it, the fact that no one had ever listened to them and then suddenly I'm there to listen was also a lot of stress because people wanted to tell me everything. I mean, they had never been able to talk to someone about their difficult lives, and I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, um, but I think people very much treated me as one, which was not healthy for me in a lot of ways. Um, but it was like once they realized that I was a, 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 a someone who wanted to listen, then just like the, 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 the floodgates, which is why, you know, the stuff about, um, all the stuff about murder and, and that sort of stuff, they were not questions that I was asking, but they were, they were things that were constantly coming up and people just assumed that, that I was prepared and um, um, to listen to those stories, even though I really wasn't. Um, but yeah, it was, I, was, I was myself shocked at how much access I got really early on. I assumed that it would have been very difficult and it was, um, it was um, not difficult at all. It was difficult to get away from it, um, which I think I finally am working to do that. But um, yeah, it was very, very, um, for whatever reason, was easy to get, to get into. Thank you very much, Jason, for your talk. Uh, thank you for your questions. <laughs> we will have to shorten the coffee break. Il faudra qu'on raccourcisse un tout petit peu la pause café, si vous voulez bien. Ten minutes, dix minutes, et on, on revient. Merci beaucoup. Merci.